In this lesson, which is the last lesson in module one, we're going to learn how to think like an analyst. So what does that mean? Well, an analyst knows how to combine their innate intellectual curiosity with thinking skills. This combination allows for deeper and more actionable thinking. An analyst thinking process consists of three components. The thinking itself, techniques, and practice. Let's unpack each one. An analyst thinks a bit differently than most. They go beyond surface level thinking and look for root cause. By doing so, it allows them to skip past the unimportant fluff and get to the meat. The way they do this is by deploying various techniques, including the five whys, which we'll learn about in this lesson. These techniques facilitate ease of thought. In other words, they help spur questions and other thought patterns that an analyst can deploy in an analysis. They then practice and practice and practice again until thinking deeply becomes natural. This again takes time, and you'll be able to practice these techniques throughout this course. Let's take a look at one powerful yet simple technique that analysts use. Enter the five whys. The five whys is the thinking technique developed by Sakichi Toyota. If that name sounds familiar, it's because it is. Toyota is considered the father of the Japanese Industrial Revolution, which spawned such mega brands as his namesake, Toyota Motor Corporation. The five whys is an iterative interrogative thinking technique that looks for cause and effect based on an escalating repetition of the question, why? It looks for root cause or multiple root causes based on this simple line of questioning. The fundamental idea behind this technique is that sometimes it takes more than one question to get to a real answer. In this case, the total is five. The reason being that there are usually a few non-answers thrown into every answer, and the five whys attempts to distill that process. So what does this look like in practice? Let's start with a simple example to illustrate this technique's power. Let's say you're talking to a coworker before a meeting who looks a bit flustered, and you want to know why. They proceed to tell you that their car stopped working and they were late for work. So you naturally ask why. And the answers to your whys come rolling in each time you ask. The answer to why number one is because I ran out of gas. You ask why again, and the answer is because I forgot to fill the tank. You ask why number three, and the answer is because I was running late to work. You proceed with why number four, and the answer is because I set my alarm for p.m. instead of a.m. And finally, you ask why number five, and the answer is because I was out late drinking with friends. Aha, so now we get to the real issue. The answer to why number five is the root cause of why their car stopped working. Running out of gas was a symptom of a bigger problem, their lack of responsibility, the root cause of the issue. Let's try this again with a little more analytically focused example. Suppose the headline reads, Millennials are buying less houses. Why is that the case? Well, let's use the five whys to get a bit more insight. So you ask why number one, and the answer, because millennials like the freedom of renting. Interesting, seems plausible. So you ask why number two, they don't value owning a home. Hmm, okay, let's ask why number three, they would rather spend their money on experiences. I've heard this before, but you're still curious. So you ask why number four, and the answer is, they actually don't have enough cash for a down payment, and they would rather spend their money on experiences. So why is that? So you ask the final why, and the answer is because they have high student loan debt that they must service each month, and that eats up the excess cash so they have limited savings. The truth of the matter is that it's a lack of financial foundation that has spawned a generation of renters who can't afford to purchase a home. By digging a bit deeper, we discovered that it's not that millennials' taste and preferences are that much different from previous generations, but rather that their financial resources are just in a little bit of a different state. 
The five whys helped us get there. Surface level thinking may have stopped us at why number two, and we could have gone with the fact that they like to spend their money on experiences and they don't value owning a home. But we would have missed the key root cause on why millennials are buying less houses. Now obviously, these are hypothetical examples, but I included them to prove the power of the technique rather than to actually analyze anything. It's a very simple yet powerful technique in determining root cause, and we're going to use it in many of our analyses in future lessons. To put the five whys into practice, it's important to follow a few ground rules. First, teamwork is encouraged. Don't go at this alone. The technique, especially in the practice stages, is best done in groups with a whiteboard present. The goal is to look for root cause while being specific. It's important to use the technique to find specific root cause, not just symptoms. So going back to the car example, irresponsibility was the root cause rather than the actual car. The car ran out of gas because the individual didn't fill it up with gas because they were late because they were out partying all night. Lastly, keep going. It may take more than five whys to get to a true root cause. It's called the five whys, but it could be the two whys, the ten whys, or even in some cases the twenty whys. Keep going until you find the true root cause. Now that you've learned how to find root cause using the five whys, it's time to look at a few other analytical techniques analysts use on a daily basis. They are as follows. The top-down approach, where you start at the highest level and you work your way down. The bottom-up approach, where you start at a granular level and work your way up. And then a technique that I will call ad hoc, which is a bit of a blend of both. Let's get into each of these in a bit more detail. First, let's start with a top-down approach. Much like it sounds, this technique involves starting from the top and working your way down. The top in this case is the data at the highest level. Think of it as large to small in terms of hierarchy. As you work your way down, the analysis gets more specific and focused. A simple geographic example would be country, to region, to state, and then to city. Country in this case is the highest level of data, and city is the lowest. A top-down analysis in this case would start with the country and then work down to the lowest level of city. So what does this look like in practice? Let's use sales data as an example. Suppose a company is looking to expand their sales territory and are looking for the right rep to promote to take over this new territory. Well, we know it's a US-based company, so that's the highest level of data we have. And we know that the company would like to focus on the Southeast region because of increased opportunity there. They've decided that Texas is a state that they would like to expand into. But, they don't have any reps currently in Texas because they haven't expanded there yet. So we need to look for cities that may be a proxy for those in Texas. So they'll look to cities in states near Texas, say Lake Charles, Louisiana, and analyze the sales for those reps in that geographic region. They could take it one step further and look at the demographics within cities and then even within neighborhoods to find similar characteristics to those they're looking to expand into into Texas. So finding the right rep with a proven track record in Louisiana, say, or similar territories should bode well for the new expansion into Texas. This was all done by a top-down analysis starting at the highest level country data and working our way down to the specific state and then to the city. Let's look at the bottom-up approach now. A bottom-up analysis would do the opposite of a top-down analysis and start at the most granular level and work its way up. As it does, it gets less and less specific and more general. So it would start with city, then state, then region, and then to the highest level of country. So using the same example of expanding into a new sales territory, we would now start at the city level and work our way up from there to state, 
region, and then ultimately the country. In the case of expanding into a new state, the outcomes of both analyses using either a top-down or bottoms-up approach are likely going to be the same. But at times, using one technique over the other can yield widely varying results. An example from personal experience has to do with what insurance companies pay for medical services. At a country level, things can look relatively the same. But as you start digging deeper, even within similar insurance carriers, you're going to get much different results and things get really interesting. So what you see at the highest country level becomes much more disparate at the city or state level. So the conclusion here is that you may need to deploy both techniques to get the answer you're looking for. The third technique is what I will call ad hoc. It's a blend of the top-down and bottom-up techniques and is used in specific contexts when a full deployment of those techniques isn't needed. An example may be to look up one specific state and then drill into a city or even one specific city within that state. It's sort of a mini top-down or bottoms-up analysis. This will all become much clearer as we do a few actual analyses in later lessons. Knowledge and technique are only good if you deploy them. And the only way to do that is through practice. Practice is made up of four stages. The first is the seed stage. This is a learning by doing stage and doing a lot of analyses so you learn the fundamentals and best practices. Doing many analyses leads to the next stage which is the growth stage where you start to see patterns and learn from your mistakes. You will notice your skills improving as you progress through this stage. This leads to the third stage or confidence. This is where things start to get fun. You start learning to come into your own and learning to embrace your analytical ability. The last stage is mastery, which in my opinion is a bit of a unicorn. I believe that analysts should look at this mastery stage as looking for the next challenge rather than a state of arrival. These stages are laid out really neatly here, but in reality it couldn't be any different. You will make mistakes, people will get mad at you for reporting data incorrectly, and it just won't be that easy. But in due time, you will get a taste of all the phases, and I hope like me, you learn to enjoy every single minute of each of them. So let's tie this all together. In this lesson, we learned that an analyst turns intellectual curiosity into actionable insight. Analysts follow the framework of thinking, technique, and practice. And that a good analyst can deploy a variety of thinking techniques and analytical techniques. And we also learned that mastery takes time and, most importantly, practice.